All right, so here's the overview, overproduction, um, genetic variation, survival of the fittest, and successful reproduction. This is an overview of natural selection. We're going to go into detail about these in just a second. But let me, um, this is, again, evolution by natural selection is how we understand evolution now. Before Darwin came out with this and before this was more accepted by um, most scientists, the understanding of evolution, there was a kind of argument. Lamarck, a guy named Lamarck, last name Lamarck, had the idea that evolution happened more so by things that happened in the organism's life. Not by genes, necessarily, um, but so, for example, the example that I was taught was giraffe. So a giraffe that has a long neck or a shorter neck over time can stretch its neck, say 10, 15 years, can stretch its neck, and um, when it has children, it will pass on that stretched neck to its offspring. So every generation, the necks get larger and larger and larger, or longer and longer and longer because of that. Um, the reason that's not true is because genes are, I mean, because traits are passed on how? By your genes. They're genetically um, passed down. So what you were born with, for the most part, is going to be exactly what you pass on to your children. There are some changes that can, might happen um, through environmental things. Um, but for the most part, your genes that you get at birth are what you pass down to your children. Um, so if you get a tattoo, that's not passed down. If you lose a finger, that's not passed down. If you're in a car wreck and you lose control of most of your body, like if you're paralyzed from the neck down, that is not passed down. If you were to spend five years uh, being a couch potato and playing video games, they got really, really good at video games and had a child, that child is no more likely to be good at video games than it was if you had not spent that five years. Um, if you spent five years working out, getting ripped and strong and just crazy athletic as far as muscles go, and you had a child, you're no more likely to have a child that is ripped and strong than you were before those five years because genes are passed down genetically. Now, your child might be more likely to be good at video games or athletic if that's what you're encouraging them to do as they grow up. So what we do as an environment, if you guys have ever heard of nature versus nurture, there is a chance, there is a difference there. Nature versus nurture. Nature is how you are born, your genes. Nurture is how you're raised. So if I were to take you out of this time period, 2019, and take you to when Genghis Khan was conquering parts of Asia and um, the Near East, when, if I moved you there when you were a child, you might enjoy seeing people killed for some kind of capital punishment. Like people in that day would take their children to view somebody getting their head chopped off. Now, today, your parents might not let you see that in a movie that we know is fake. But back then, they would take that to actually happen and see um, that happening. So your genes would not change, but what's your, uh, like, hey, you talk to your friend instead of saying, hey, let's go see that Marvel video. Hey, so-and-so is getting executed today. You want to bring some popcorn or whatever their equivalent would be and go watch that? Like, your genes didn't change, but your environment does change. Um, so point being kind of got sidetracked. Point being, natural selection is how evolution works. That's how we understand evolution. So let's keep going. Go ahead and write this down. Overproduction. Overproduction. Production. What does that mean? To produce something. To make something. What is overproduction? Yeah, you're making too much. You're making more than what you actually need. If I said, um, go ahead, I need one apple tree planted, um, and you were to go and buy me three or four, that's overdoing it. Um, if I were to say, hey, I need enough salad for two people, I need you to plant enough stuff in your garden to, to supply two people for their salads for the year, and you were to plant, uh, you know, a million salad, plant, uh, like lettuce or spinach or something like that, then that's way too much. That's overproducing. In natural selection, overproduction um, happens, and you've seen this, if you've had pets, if you've had a cat or a dog give birth to kittens or puppies, do they ever give just like birth to one normally? No, no there's a, what's it called? A litter, a litter of, of puppies or a litter, I think cats, do they call it a litter of kittens? Mm -hmm. Kitten litter? Um, that happens in nature. Have you guys ever had a runt? If that's ever happened to you, did you ever have a runt that was born? Do y'all know what a runt is? What's a runt? The smaller 
the smallest. What do you think in nature would happen to that runt? It would die. It would be the most likely to die. Even if it doesn't die, chances are, unless something happened, it's probably going to be the most likely that will die. So if you look at the bottom left, um, there's some sea turtles. Now, sea turtles, I don't know if you know this, but the mama comes up from the beach, digs a hole, not super fast. Um, if you've seen videos of this, it looks like she's pooping out eggs. She turns around, lays her eggs that are already fertilized and everything, covers the hole up, and she dips out. She doesn't go out there and wait in the ocean and, you know, waiting for all the babies and counting them as they come. Okay, number five didn't make it. Is that okay? Okay, all right, well, let's go. And they swim off together. These turtles, when they're born, they're on their own from birth. They have to climb out of the hole, run across the beach, swim against the waves. And if you've ever tried to go into a big waves, it's difficult. It's difficult to go out into the ocean when there's waves coming at you. Imagine being the size of a turtle and being like two minutes old. So they have to swim out into the ocean, and then they have to wait, they have to live and stay alive until they can have babies. Um, and so what do you think happens between their whole, where they're born at and the beach? A lot of them die. How do they die? By predators. Now, some of them may not even be born. They may not even hatch. Or if they do hatch, maybe they're squished by their brothers and sisters, and then they can actually go, uh, they have to make it to the beach to get to the water, and then they have to fight the waves. All those things, there are some that are dying, correct? Like there are sea turtles that are dying every step of the way. And so in order to kind of combat that, what, what has happened over time is a lot of animals go through this stage. They overproduce. They produce way more than they're going to actually make it to adulthood. And I don't remember the numbers. I believe the, uh, you can see the hyperlink, turtle production. You can kind of barely see it on my screen. If you click on that, there's a TED Ed video that show goes through all the different things that they go through to try to make it to adulthood, and it's kind of rough. Uh, tadpoles, top right, see the tadpoles? Have you ever seen tadpoles in a, like a pond? Are there that many frogs like two months later? No, because frogs overproduce, fish overproduce. If you've ever seen, um, oh, I can't remember what fish eggs are called, row. Row. So in a fish, if you ever go fishing and you catch a female fish, sometimes you will find the eggs of that fish in the fish. And so they haven't um, gotten to the right point to where they uh, lay the eggs. Well, all those eggs aren't going to make it to adulthood. A lot of those eggs are going to be, or a lot of those fish will be eaten way before they make it to adulthood. So overproduction is an extremely important step because they have to do, most of the uh, organisms are going to what? They're going to die. Most of them are going to die. At least some of them are going to die. All right, next one. Genetic variation. Genetic variation. Go ahead and write that down. All offspring are not the same. All offspring are different. Somehow. So some of them are more, are more obvious. Um, so mutations can happen. Um, I'm sorry, mutations that happen are almost always bad. But even if there are no mutations, are you exactly the same as your brother or your sister? No. no. Now, you have some, some, some similarities, but you are not the same as your brother and sister. You're not even the same as your mom and your dad because you're only half this, genetically, you're half of your mom, half of your dad. So there are a lot of genetic variations. Most of them don't have a huge effect. But some of them do. If you look at the picture with the moths, those are the moths of Manchester. And if you remember from the other video, the moths of Manchester, we'll talk about that on the next slide. But the moths of Manchester happened during the Industrial Revolution. Um, and genetic variation led to the population going from kind of white colored to black colored. If you look at the, I don't know if those are radishes or turnips, I can't remember what those are. Um, but some of them look like carrots. See, some of these look like carrots. Some of them definitely do not look like carrots. And they're all the same species. I believe all of these are the same species. They're different variations, but they're all the same species. What about that monkey, the little chimp? Which one do you think is more likely to live to adulthood? The black one? Yes, the one that is a normal color. The white one, the albino one, is very likely, unless they live inside of a zoo or have a group of... Um, I guess maybe sympathetic, I don't know what the word would be, sympathetic um, family or population, it's probably not going to make it. What about an alligator? 
predator. Does the alligator have to, uh, you know, run away from other predators? No. Not for the most part. So would an albino alligator do well? Yes. Yeah, there's albino alligators. Why would an albino alligator maybe not fare so well in nature? Yeah. Guys, if you're a raccoon on the bank of a river, and you and you just thought there was a law going by, but in fact it was an alligator and it ate you, that's understandable because the alligator blends in. If you see a white alligator coming and you don't move, that's the raccoon's fault, right? Like, it's not going to be blending in nearly as well as as the. Uh, camouflaged alligator. So that doesn't mean it dies at an early age, but it just has a very less, has a lesser chance of making it to adulthood and having babies than the one that's not albino. Does that answer your question? Um, that seal. Those other ones? Oh, sorry. These other ones right here, all of those, they look kind of like rocks. If you are a polar bear running after these seals, I don't know if these seals get eaten by polar bears, which one would you probably go for? The one that's a difficult, that kind of blends in with the rocks as it's running, or the one that's white and sticks out like a sore thumb? White. Yes, guys, so that one's probably not going to pass on its genes to the next generation. If it does, maybe, let's say all of these seals live, the next year there might be two or three of these seals, white seals. And if they all live, maybe two or three or four the next year. So the white seals will grow in population. But if it dies very unlikely that there's more white seals next year. There might be one again, but there's not going to be 16 white seals the next year because that gene gets taken out because it doesn't get to reproduce. Yeah. All right, the next slide. Go ahead and write. I think this is the same. Oh, I think this is the same thing, but look at these pictures. How many moths do you see? Four. There are four. Do you, which, one of them is difficult to see, correct? The one on the very left is difficult to see. This one is difficult to see. So um, I'll restate what happened for the Moss of Manchester very quickly, but I went into detail in the other videos. Moss of Manchester, this is during the Industrial Revolution when there's a lot of coal pollution being put out into the sky. Before the Industrial Revolution, the trees looked like this. Um, I believe it's a birch tree. This one that looks like is a birch tree. Um, but you can see there's bark and there's different colors, kind of speckled. The speckled moth fits in really, really, really well. The speckled moth fits in really well. And periodically, because there's a recessive gene floating around for black moths, and I'm just kind of going with this, um, that black moth gene might pop up every once in a while, and there's a black moth um, that's out there. Now, if you're a bird, and there's moths, and you see there's this moth on the tree and this moth on the tree, which one would you go for? Why? Because you can see it a lot easier. Even if you did see the speckled moth, which I don't think you would, this one you can see really well. I bet if you were to zoom out of the tree as a whole, you would not be able to see this at all. We can, we can just barely see it because we know that there's something there. This black moth sits out, sticks out pretty well. And if it was still, maybe it'd have a chance. But if it's moving around, um, it's probably going to get eaten. Well, Industrial Revolution happened. And over time, all the po pollution from coal and stuff like that, this industry got into the air. It got onto the trees, and the trees changed color. The tree had soot all over it. And so now these moths that used to blend in really well, they stick out pretty, pretty badly. And the ones that stuck out pretty easily and the, the predators could see, now they blend in a lot better. So now it became an advantage because of something that changed in the environment. It became an advantage to be that rare 2 or 3% of the population that were really, really, really dark winged. I don't know what you'd call it. Um, their coloration was darker. And these ones that used to have an advantage, they used to be the most fit in this area. Now they are at a disadvantage. So over time, pretty quickly, the moth population changed. These genes started popping up a lot more because they were able, this black moth is able to grow, have babies, and those babies could grow and have babies, and those babies could grow and have babies, to where the population of the moths started changing. There's a lot more black moths than there were speckled or white moths. Um, anyway, so that's an example of genetic variation, kind of this, um, this change that is normally a bad thing, but every once in a while is a good thing. Again, another plug for moths in Manchester. All right, here we go. Next one. Survival of the fittest. Survival of the fittest. And I wrote the best in parentheses because 
I mean, uh, in quotation marks, because this isn't always what we would consider best. Sometimes, most of the time, I think we consider best the fastest, the strongest, the most brave. Our qualities as a human for what, be- what is best may not be what Mother Nature prefers in it, all of its animals. So if you're a rabbit, a bunny rabbit, is bravery or courage a good trait? No. The more skittish and the more flighty you are, the better. So you see in the bottom pictures these animals that are fighting. These are the males. Surprise, surprise, they're the most aggressive. They're going to fight um, to see who can get the females. So the winner of these gets an, either an area, a territory, or um, I don't know what you would call it, but kind of like a harem of females. So the ladies want a, a I don't know what else to call it, a baby daddy that is going to be stronger and can protect. So if a wolf comes up or, you know, I don't know, for whatever reason, the, the ladies, the does, or the, I don't know what that would be for a ram, but for the deer, the doe wants a male that is strong and has a nice um, uh, antlers or rack that's going to be able to fight and protect. I don't know if protect is the best word, but to fight. Um, and that's the best, that is what is best for that animal. For... Um, for plants, it may be the fastest growing or the being able to exist in a very low amount of light. Or for a cactus, it's very little water. Cacti can go for a long time without a lot of water. If you put a cactus in a swamp, it's probably going to die because that's not what its fit. That's not how. That's not what its niche is. So survival of the fittest is fitting, filling the niche, the best. So it could be the fastest, the most skittish. Um, however, it best fits in that niche. Last one. Successful reproduction. And the cycle starts over. Successful reproduction. If an organism can get to adulthood to where they can reproduce, then whatever genes that they have can get passed on to the next generation. Even if they're not, even if they're not the most fit genes, they still get passed on. But what happens over time, the genes that are not very fit or not the best will eventually get weeded out. So going back to our example, you may have a bunny rabbit or a deer that is a brave bunny rabbit or deer. And say it does stand up to the wolf or it does try to. If that's the case, maybe those genes get passed on, but eventually those genes are going to end in the the termination of those, of that, off of those, um, I guess, ancestry. So if you think about it, if you don't have kids, if you specifically don't have kids, do you know you're the first person in your entire line of ancestors that did not have kids? Think about that. Does that make sense? If you fail to have kids because of preference or you just don't want, like, because you don't want to or you physically can't, or as, as kind of dark as this is, if you don't make it to that age to where you can have children, do you know you're the first person in your entire ancestry all the way up that does not have kids? How do you know that's true? Because you wouldn't be here if somebody didn't have kids. I'm not talking about your aunt and your uncle. I'm talking about your direct grandfather, grandmother, great-grandfather, great-grandmother, all the way back. All the way back, somebody... I mean, every, every single time somebody has had a child, um, which, I mean, if you think about it like that, it's kind of a lot of pressure, um, but it's not a lot of pressure. It doesn't really matter, for our species at least. Um, so successful reproduction, the ones that live, reproduce. Pretty simple. If you're the dandelion that can make um, seeds that can float off really far or not, if you can get to adulthood and you can make offspring, your genes have been reproduced. You have... You have fulfilled that part. If you're a cheetah that can run fast enough and get the antelope or whatever, and you make it to adulthood, then you are able to pass on those genes to the next generation. And the cycle starts over, and it goes over and over and over and over and over again. Overproduction. A bunch of babies. All those babies are different. Some of those babies die. Some of those babies live. And the ones that live reproduce and start the process over. 
And every time, it's almost like the scientific method. The scientific method does not lead to success every single time. But eventually, if you do the scientific method enough, you're learning every time and you're going to get some kind of good result. That, that's, that's kind of the goal. Eventually, this system will lead to the species getting better, to being more fit. So let's look at this picture. Look at the rabbits up there. They're all brothers and sisters. Some of them are far off. A lot of them are in the foreground right here. They're all together. Why do you think it would be beneficial to be all together? Well, not necessarily to fight off the wolf, but if I see my brother that's right here see something behind me and run, I don't have to turn around and look to figure out if it's bad. I'm just running as well. Like I'm going to take off, so more eyes. Well, Let's say that they're all different and one of them or a group of them are back here in the back and they're like, you know what, I don't care about wolves or I don't want to be close to them, I want to be off by myself. Well, if you're, when the wolf comes, because there's a genetic variation, a desire to do whatever, or maybe one's not as camouflaged or maybe one has a, uh, a genetic problem with one of their hind legs and can't run very fast, whatever it is, their genetic variation leads to one of them dying and others, like some of them dying and some of them living. And the ones that live make babies. If you, it is not a, this is not a super complicated thing. A bunch of babies, they're all different. Some of them are more fit. The more fit survive, the less fit die. And over time, that will happen over and over and over again. And it leads to the benefit of the species.